Hello everyone, welcome to episode two in this series of recapping American Horror Story. I'm Kane, and today I'm going to be explaining the characters and timeline of American Horror Story Asylum. This is one of my favorite seasons. I would say it's top three, depending on the day. There are a couple things that are different about this board, as you might have seen. Down here, we definitely have less supporting characters and they are broken down based on what year they appear in. The 2012 characters flops and the 1964 side characters. We also have a mystery character here, Bloody Face, who I will reveal to you guys when the time is right. Unlike I did with Tate in Murder House being Rubberman. Another thing, the timeline is much more condensed as far as days go. I'm still doing the same thing with the uh, flashbacks and then the flash forwards, and then the main timeline will be here in the middle. I also realized my mistake last time where I cut up every single individual day instead of just going by episode. So that's what I did. I cut them up by episode so there's less time spent on cutting. But yeah, overall, this board was just so much easier to put together because I knew what I was actually doing, and I think it looks a lot, a lot cleaner. Also, I feel like having a blackboard is just so iconic because in season two, it's just, it's a much more dark season than um, Murder House was. So that is why it is on a blackboard instead of a whiteboard. I feel like for most of the seasons going forward, I'm gonna use white, but for this one, we're using black. Another thing. There are no lines connecting the characters this season, and I debated over this for a while. Every single character here interacts with the other characters, so I feel as though it would just be one, a waste of time, and two, very convoluted and a big mess if I was to try and connect these eight characters with Marker. I think the only connections that we don't really see that much would be Arden and Lana. And I think that's really the only thing that we don't see because they are in an asylum. So it's a small condensed space, similar to how Murder House was, but a lot of the characters in Murder House really only interact with a couple people at a time. In Asylum, there's a common room, there's common areas where everyone gets to interact with each other and it allows everybody to get to know every other main character, if that makes sense. A deep dive into the characters. Here we have Miss Lana Winters. And yes, I'm using a star because there is an episode that is dedicated to Christmas, so I felt that this was appropriate. I did want to get a white or a black one to match like the white and black vibe I have going on here, but green was the only available option at Dollar Tree, so that's what I have. She's the closest thing we have to a main character here. She's ambitious, she's mother, quite frankly. She's just a tad selfish, just a little bit. She's a little self-involved. One thing about Miss Winters, she loves a story. She loves getting in on the action and exposing the truth. We have Sister Jude Martin. She is also mother, played by Miss Jessica Lang, who played Constance in season one. She is probably my favorite Jessica Lang character if I had to choose. It's tough between her and Fiona. It's really close. Some things I wrote down about her is that she's very stern and at least in the beginning, very authoritarian in the asylum. She runs things her way. She's very strict and stern. She's just a little bit troubled and we'll see what that means for her in episode two and three, I believe, is when we start learning about her and her backstory. I think the show also benefited by making Jessica Lang more of a mainstay and less of like a side character, because she was a little bit of a side character in Murder House. She was kind of on the outside of the action. In this, the story more or less revolves around her in some aspects. Next, we have Sister Mary Eunice, who essentially turns into the devil in episode two. So the words I wrote down for her character are mainly based on the first episode where we get to see a little bit of her personality before the devil just takes over. So some things about Sister Mary Eunice, uh, she's very innocent, very childlike, quiet, and Sister Mary Eunice is very obedient to Sister Jude. I think I forgot to mention, she is the head nun at the asylum, so she's in charge of overseeing the health and well-being of all of her patients at the asylum, a thing she does not do a very good job at, but she's still serving. Next, we have Dr. Oliver Threadson, and some things I've written down about him are he's very forward-thinking for a doctor at the time. He, at one point, Sister Jude administers electroshock therapy to Lana Winters here, who is gay. Threadson here is 
disgusted by this because obviously that's inhumane. He doesn't technically work for the asylum, but he eventually sees a couple of its patients and tries to help them escape. Next, we have Dr. Arthur Arden. Now, Dr. Arthur Arden is a war criminal from Nazi Germany. That's his character. That tells you basically everything you need to know about him. Vile. Just awful, terrible, cruel, gross, disgusting. Next, we have Grace over here, and she is a little bit of a liar. She's a little bit of a storyteller. She likes to make things up. We'll see why in a couple episodes. She is also very loyal to Kit, and Kit is loyal to her for the time being. And then we have a crust. A crust on the season. He's gross. He's really disgusting. I don't like him. He is the barnacle on this season. He's very hypocritical. And finally, we end here with Kit Walker. Now, he is loyal, kind, and very forgiving. He's just a good person who is being framed. By who? That's the question. The season has its main story here in the 60s, 1964 and 65 to be exact, and then has flash forwards to 2012 and even flashbacks to before the 60s. But the main story takes place in 1964. All right, the first scene of Asylum episode one, we begin in 2012, October 11th, 2012, and we see Adam Levine, what a guest star, first of all. Yeah, Jenna Tatum and Adam Levine, they're a couple. What a combination, by the way. What a combination of celebrities. We see these two stumbling into an old asylum and they are walking around and they are trying to have sex in this asylum. And the audience already knows that they're gonna see these two dead in very, very uh, gruesome fashion. So this whole event happens over the course of like four or five episodes and it's very stretched out throughout the season, but I'm just going to explain it all here in this moment because essentially one thing happens. So these two end up dead, killed by Bloody Face. Now Bloody Face is a serial killer from the 60s. He basically cuts the skin off of his uh, victims' faces and wears them as a mask. Now I didn't include a picture of him on here. There are some copycat killers that come in as well. The real one just kills them. We begin the main story, day one, October 25th, 1964. We see Kit Walker here and he is working at a gas station where he is harassed by a couple of townies. We just see him leaving his shift at work. He goes home to his wife Alma. These two are married and they are in an interracial marriage in 1964. Kit often gets teased by his quote friends about this and Kit thinks that it is his friends attacking them but um, eventually they are both abducted by aliens and we will get more into the aliens later, but that is a part of this season that a lot of people don't like. We skip down two weeks to November 9th, 1964, and we see Miss Lana Winters entering the asylum to get an interview from Jude about the bakery, but she is technically going undercover to get information about Kit, who is accused of being bloody face. It is stated here that Kit's wife, Alma, was found skinned and that's how they figured out that it was Kit because her, his wife was found dead. So Lana enters and she is greeted by Pepper. Now Pepper, fan favorite Pepper here, she is saying that she wants to play with Miss Lana as she enters. Sister Mary Eunice reveals to Lana because she walks over and sees Pepper is out trying to talk to Lana. And so she reveals to Lana that Pepper tried to sleep with her sister's husband and then killed her sister's baby. So yeah, that's Pepper. She's a star. Lana goes into the asylum and has her interview with Jude and Jude can already sniff an atheist and a lesbian from far away. And basically during their conversation, Jude says that she can see right through Lana's little facade and Lana is one of those reporters that runs to the scene of a crime to get a scoop on the story. And that is exactly what she is doing here with Kit, who is arriving at the asylum this day. So her main motive is to try and get a big story that will get her 
famous because she wants to be a real journalist and not necessarily just like a reporter. So then we see Kit arriving at Briarcliff in chains. He is considered very dangerous, so he's locked up basically as soon as he gets there, put in solitary, perhaps. We have a scene where Jude welcomes Kit into the asylum and she goes over some of the ground rules and Kit claims that he is innocent and that he was abducted by little green men, the aliens, uh, to which nobody here believes quite literally until the very end of the season. Kit is then welcomed into the common room where a song that plays over and over and over again is blasting everyone's ears out and he meets Grace as he tries to turn it off and she says that he should really rather not do that because he will get caned for it and this is where their relationship begins, two inmates in an asylum. We then have a scene of Jude confronting Arden, who is the medical specialist at the asylum. We don't know that he is a Nazi yet, but we come to find out in episode four. Here we see Jude confronting him about certain patients disappearing, and he he's all tight-lipped, babes. He's not giving anything uh, Jude finds it very suspicious that all the patients that disappear under his care have no family. He's got something fishy going on. Mr. Arden here loves an experiment. That night we see Lana back at her home after she was forced to leave the asylum and she is having dinner with her girlfriend, Wendy Pizer. They are in a same-sex relationship and Wendy is a teacher. If anything got out about these two in this small town, uh, her career would be ruined and her career would be ruined as well. So that is something to take into consideration. The next day, November 10th, 1964, Kit is in Dr. Arden's office. Arden is determined to find out the truth about Kit and his claim that he was abducted by aliens. He finds a hard mass in his neck. He cuts it out. And basically this is what the aliens are using to track Kit. Later on, we see Lana entering the asylum again, this time through a secret passageway that Billy Rabe's character, Sister Mary Eunice, was using to basically get in and out without being seen so that she could feed some of Arthur Arden's monsters. And we'll get more into that. Basically, he's conducting experiments. She is helping him with that. God knows why. Lana figures this out and uses that information to get into the asylum using Sister Mary Eunice's secret passageway. We see Jude having dinner with Timothy. We see that she fancies him in a romantic way. However, Timothy is a monsignor and she is a nun, so that is forbidden here. Timothy has a dream to become Pope of New York with Jude by his side. They make an interesting power couple. She is just always suspicious of Arden and questions Timothy why he would hire such an awful piece of shit. So while Lana enters the asylum, she walks around looking for Kit, but ends up finding something else entirely. She gets knocked out and attacked by this thing. Later on that night, she's found by Jude and taken prisoner without a cause. So then we see the next day, day 17, uh, November 11th, 1964. Mary demands to be punished for letting Lana in and she sees getting caned by Sister Jude as this way to be punished. What was with the canes? What was with the canes this season? Why did we need to include Jessica Lang smacking people over and over again in the ass, in the posterior perhaps, with a cane. Why did we need to include that? While Lana is still unconscious the next morning from this whole ordeal, Jude heads over to Lana's house to find Wendy, her girlfriend, and basically blackmails her into signing over custody of Lana to the asylum for homosexuality. Now this is a nightmare for Lana because all she wanted was the story on Kit and now she ends up getting a look into the asylum herself as one of its patients. We see Lana waking up and she's very distraught obviously. Jude says that she had an accident and that she's not going anywhere. Basically she is now prisoner here just as well as Kit and Grace are prisoners. We have a small scene of Jude and Arden, where Arden is cleaning up one of his storage spaces and there are scratches all over the wall. And Jude is still very, very, very suspicious of this man, uh, rightfully so. Jude says that she will get to the truth and figure out what this man is planning in all of these secret storage areas. The episode ends with 
2012, the same day, October 11th, where Bloody Face finds Jenna here running all up and down the asylum. And that's where we end episode one. So the day after Lana is committed to Briarcliff, her girlfriend Wendy right here is murdered by Bloody Face. Yes, indeed, Bloody Face is still out and about, and it is not Kit. Lana, however, does not know about this for a long time. She obviously does not have access to newspapers or anything like that. Her mind is still on being betrayed by Wendy and she doesn't even think that Wendy is in any kind of trouble. Jude and Arden uh, both agree that Lana needs electroshock therapy for her behavior in acting all rowdy and her reaction of being committed here. So Lana undergoes electroshock therapy. We see Dr. Oliver Threadson for the first time arriving at the asylum to meet with Kit Walker. He's been appointed to Kit's case uh, to deem if he is sane or not and whether or not he deserves to spend the rest of his days at the asylum or go to the electric chair. We have a scene with Mary and Arden in which Arden offers Mary a candied apple, and here we see Mary very hesitant to take a bite out of it because, quote, sweets lead to sin. We have a scene where Threadson confronts Jude about the treatment of some of the patients here. He saw Lana's electroshock therapy and certain practices at this asylum that are not ethical or moral or even up to the state standard perhaps at this point. We have a flop character named Jed who I didn't put on the board. He basically is brought to the asylum by his parents and there is an exorcism done on him by Timothy Jude and the priest from their church. The devil that is in Jed brings up some certain things from Jude's past and she's very affected by this, talking about a girl in blue on a bike and we'll get a flashback of it. So on June 22nd, 1949, 15 years ago before these events happen. Jude is not a nun at the time. She is singing in a club. We learn that she's in a band. Uh, she goes home and is driving drunk when she all of a sudden hits a girl in blue on a bike. We then jump back to the present day. Uh, Kit, Grace, and Lana all meet up to form an escape plan and Lana does not realize that Kit is a part of this plan. She was just thinking it was going to be Grace and herself trying to get out, but because she still believes that Kit is bloody face, she basically calls the authorities on them and they are sent to get caned by Jude. While the exorcism is happening, we see the spirit of Jed leave his body and Jed dies, flop, and the devil enters Sister Mary Eunice. Now, for the rest of the season, uh, Sister Mary Eunice is no longer Sister Mary Eunice. She is the devil. Lily Rabe here, iconic performance. And with that, the episode ends. All right, so episode three opens with Adam and his wife getting killed by a copycat, a bloody face uh, killer, and they are there at the same time as the real killer. We have like three or four bloody faces running around here in the present day in 2012, and one of the copycat killers is the one that kills Leo and Teresa in the opening scene of episode three. Day 19, November 13th, 1964. The episode takes place over one day, uh, so November 13th. Jude is given a newspaper about the uh, murder that she committed in 1949, which I talked about in the last episode. And she is all distraught by this. Mary Eunice brings it to her and she said that the mailman brought it to her, but Jude is convinced that it's someone toying with her. Jude is automatically the most suspicious about Arden and Threadson when it comes to who gave her the lipstick and the newspaper because another thing that Jude is being taunted with is the lipstick that Sister Mary Eunice was wearing in the scene in which she handed her the newspaper. She was wearing a uh, Ravish Me Red lipstick, which is a reference to Jude's red lingerie. 
So Jude is just convinced that someone is after her. Someone might very well be after her. We have a scene where Sister Mary Eunice kills one of the inmates. This is just to show to the audience that Sister Mary Eunice is no longer Sister Mary Eunice. She is the devil incarnate babes. We have another scene where Sister Mary Eunice, aka the devil, brings Jude some wine. Now, Jude, who is a known alcoholic, I think I might have said that earlier, she uh, does not bop anymore. Once she went under the cloth, she went no more alcohol for me. We then see Lana in the common room and she ends up meeting Threadson here. He offers to help her get over her homosexuality because he says that electroshock therapy is definitely not a humane way to get over homosexuality, but conversion therapy is somehow humane. There's a storm brewing here at Briarcliff. To get uh, all the inmates distracted from this, Jude plans a movie night in which they're going to be watching The Sign of the Cross, which is a movie I think from the 30s during the whole storm to distract all the patients. During this, a character called Shelly, who we saw in the first episode but I didn't really talk about her, she wants to be a part of the escape plan that Kit and Grace are planning. This is escape plan number two, babes. This is escape plan number two. And Lana, who heard from Threadson that the bloody face killings are still happening and that Wendy is uh, dead or missing because Threadson went to Lana's house or something to check up on Wendy and no one was there. So Threadson brought this information to Lana and now that makes Lana believe that Kit is innocent because how could the killings happen whilst Kit, who is the alleged bloody face happen while he's here. So we have our escape plan team. It is Kit, Grace, Lana, and now Shelly, who's down here because she's not a main character. So the plan is to, while everyone is distracted with the movie, escape through the secret passageway that Lana uh, entered in through. And so she is kind of like the ringleader here, basically, even though she called the cops on them last time. She is uh, with them this time. We see Jude then breaking her promise to be alcohol free, and we see her drinking uh, quite a bit of wine in her office right before she introduces the film and during this scene where she introduces the film she is quite iconic let me put that out right now this performance is iconic she really just recited the entire lyrics to you'll never walk alone and thought we wouldn't notice so we see our escape team uh, Kit Lana and Grace actually make it out, but one of the orderlies has Shelly, or rather Shelly is distracting one of the orderlies uh, via some sexual favors. It's disgusting. Just as Miss Girl tries to make it out, she is caught by Arden. So during the film, these three slip out, basically, and they're able to get out, but then are chased by Dr. Arden's monsters that are just outside the door. So they run back in and they are all wet. They end up back inside the movie and act like nothing happened. Shelly here is almost R-worded by Arden. However, Arden um, decides that he would rather use her as one of uh, his experiments and starts injecting her with turns her into a, a monster, then gets her legs cut off that night, and we'll see that in the next episode. But basically, he cuts her legs off because she tried to escape. Jude has an encounter with an alien, but she's drunk, so she doesn't really remember it all that well. And basically, that wraps up episode three. We have these three trying to escape, but they end up back in the asylum. Pepper ends up getting abducted by the aliens. Shelly, obviously, goes missing under Arden's care. And then there's also a different character that Sister Mary Eunice killed earlier on in the episode. All right, so let's move on to episodes four and five. All right, so episodes four and five are a two-part episode called I Am and Frank. So I've decided to include them together in the timeline. We begin on day 20, November 14th, 1964. A woman is brought to the asylum. Her name is Charlotte, but she goes by the name Anne Frank. She claims that she escaped Nazi Germany, Auschwitz, and came to the United States. Once the camp was liberated, she was 
too sick to say her name was Anne Frank or something. It was a whole thing. Basically, she claims that she's Anne Frank and she got into a bar fight, I believe it was, uh, over some anti-Semitism that she was standing up for. At first, Sister Jude is having absolutely none of this. She says, that does not make sense, babes. You, did you read the diary? Miss girl is dead. She is not alive anymore. She died in the camps, perhaps. Miss girl shows her her tattoo and that convinces her. We have a scene where Shelly is being injected by that sounds wrong. Shelly is injected with Dr. Arden's serum that turns her into a monster, as I mentioned in the last episode. And then the next day, so day 21, November 15th, we see Arden, who is shooting Kit up with more x-rays, looking for more things, because he is just paranoid that the Russians or even the Jews are spying on him and his work here at this asylum, which, girl, what, why would they be doing that? He is just so paranoid over nothing. Like, it's aliens, babes. It's aliens. We get a flashback because Kit asks Grace what really happened to get her here at this asylum. Uh, August 5th, 1959, so a few years before uh, the 1964 events start, Grace is accused of killing her whole family and is taken here to the asylum. Day 21 again, so November 15th, Anne is uh, taken to the common room and in walks Dr. Arden. Now, Miss Girl claims that she recognizes him from Auschwitz, and this is when the whole Nazi conspiracy begins. This is when the cancellation begins here at Briarcliff. She claims that he was at the camps and was not only one of the SS officers, but quite a gross, vile, evil scientist SS officer. So we get a flashback to that. Uh, September 5th, 1944, Arden went by a different name at the time. I believe it's Hans Gruber was his name. So back to the present day, it's again, November 15th. Kit meets with Thredson and Thredson basically convinces Kit that he is guilty and gets him to confess on tape that he did it because that is the only way that will truly allow Kit to remember what he did is if he actually says it in Threadson's mind. Later that day, we see these two meet up again and they are in the bakery and they have sex. They are caught by the nuns and taken to Jude to get caned again. Jude basically threatens to sterilize both of them. I think I forgot to mention this, but in an earlier episode, uh, Arden meets with a sex worker. She runs off because she uh, sees a lot of Nazi memorabilia. Gross photos, disgusting photos, disgusting memorabilia of this man in his house. And so she runs off and reports it to the police. So the police show up at Briarcliff's doorstep to ask him some questions. And in walks Jude, and Jude hears them say Nazi memorabilia, and she says, go back, rewind, tell me, tell me what, what, what'd you just say there? Then we see Lana beginning conversion therapy with Threadson. Lana is injected with some kind of serum that makes her sick and visually repulsed by certain visual stimuli, such as pictures of naked women, including a picture of her girlfriend that Dr. Threadson found in her house. Now, why do you have that? Jude ultimately brings more concern to Timothy about Arden being a Nazi. Timothy basically just writes it off as, oh, it's just a crazy patient. He's not a Nazi. Then we get a scene where he calls Arden and says that Jude is on to him. Now, this is a reveal that these two are working together or have had a working relationship and he already knows about the whole Nazi situation. In solitary, both of these two are in their own separate rooms, though kind of adjacent to each other, right next to each other, so they can still talk to each other. Uh, Grace reveals the truth to Kit that she actually did kill her family and she lied to him. Ooh, girl. We get a scene where Threadson promises to break Lana out by the end of the week, which is promising. Then while Kit is in solitary, he confesses to Jude that it was him who did the bloody face killings. However, I think it's just because he is all distressed and he doesn't really know what to believe at this point. And he's been convinced by Threadson and certain figures here at this asylum that he is guilty. However, he is not because there are still killings happening. Because Miss Girl here is so suspicious of Arden, she takes one of the guns off of the police officers that were there to question Arden earlier in the day, takes it for herself and shoots the man in the leg. Oh my goodness. And he is taken to the hospital 
for a few days and we'll pick back up on his story when he comes back. So then day 25, so November 19th, just a few days later, uh, Jude hires this guy called Sam and he, I didn't, I didn't get a picture of him, but he's basically like a Nazi investigator and he uh, keeps track of Nazis that are on the run and has like a whole, a whole wall, basically kind of like this one with pictures and newspaper clippings and stuff that are all evidence of certain survivors of the SS officers. So she hires this guy, Sam, to uh, figure out if this man is actually a Nazi. We then get Anne's husband who shows up to the asylum to take her home home and claims she doesn't know who the guy is and it's like girl drop the act you're not Anne Frank the guy is quite literally like that's not Anne Frank babes and she has a son that she has to take care of she needs to come home. She is released to his care by Jude because she feels like she can't really do anything for her. You know, like she needs to be with her son. We get a scene where the aliens show up at Grace's cell and plant something in her. Two days later, day 27, so November 21st, 1964, Arden returns back to the asylum and thanks Mary Eunice for cleaning up the mess of Shelly down in his uh, office space because Anne saw Shelly with no legs, a decrepit monster down in Arden's office in which they checked up on and found that she was nowhere to be seen and that this woman was just making stuff up. We then see a scene where Anne is again brought back into the asylum two days after she left it because she is acting very hostile towards her baby and is not doing a good job at parenting him and the husband is like, yeah, maybe you do belong here actually. We see Lana and Threadson meet at the bottom of the stairs where at the end of the day he takes her home in a car with him and she finally escapes the asylum with the help of Threadson. Arden authorizes a lobotomy for Anne. November 22nd, the next day, we see Anne is released. Lana is taken to Threadson's house and he's acting a little, he's acting a little suspicious. She goes to the bathroom because she's automatically suspicious of this man. And uh, whilst looking for the bathroom, she finds a secret closet in which she is confronted by him at the doorway and he says that he likes to make furniture and she's like what kind of materials do you like to use and he says skin and then she falls down a chute and that's where episode five ends We then move down to day 29, so November 23rd, 1964. Jude turns down a woman who's trying to commit her daughter for murder, okay? However, despite the fact that they don't have a children's ward, this woman leaves her child here in the care of the asylum. So then Lana wakes up in Threadson's basement the next morning after he dropped the floor from underneath her in the last episode, which with this, it's revealed that Dr. Threadson is in fact bloody face. And the reason that he got himself appointed to Kit's case was to blame it on someone other than himself. This whole episode is basically dedicated to Threadson and telling Lana his story and how he has mommy issues, skins his victims to feel close to as if he was like, close to the skin of his mother. He just has a whole fetish. We then get a scene where Sam calls Jude. Oh, I do have him on the board. I didn't even realize. Sam calls Jude to confirm, to confirm to her that Arden is a Nazi. Okay, so maybe this girl Anne was really Anne Frank. Okay, we see because Shelly was let loose by Mary Eunice in the last episode, she ends up at a hospital after terrorizing some kids at a school and uh, is found by Timothy Howard, who then goes to that hospital and kills her. Flop. Why would you let this man get away with all he's gotten away with without sending him to the police? Again, the men in this show, awful. The only one we like is Kit. We get a flashback to October 4th, 1962. This is when the church first took control of the asylum. Arden was already working here, but, but Mary Eunice, Sister Jude, and Timothy Howard, and then the rest of the nuns started working there. This is when the tuberculosis epidemic was at the worst, babes, and they had over 100 bodies every single day 
leave the asylum, which is crazy. We see these two beginning their working relationship and he tells him about his plans to create superhumans as he calls them, but they're really just monsters infected with tuberculosis. God knows what uh, what drugs he's putting in them as well. So then back to day 29, November 23rd, Timothy confronts Arden because he's not okay with it anymore. Suddenly he wants to change his tune and he wants to report this man or confront him, I guess, about these experiments. Arden just says that Jude is the real problem because he's in too deep in this conspiracy and if Jude finds out, she's taken everybody down basically and Arden says, well, you have to double down on this or else you're gonna end up exposed forever. We see the child that was left at the asylum spending some time with Mary Eunice and Mary basically reveals, it's really the devil, revealing that she hates working for Sister Jude. We then get a scene where Timothy confronts Jude and basically fires her because of her behavior on the night of the storm where she started reciting the lyrics of you'll never walk alone and just acting like a drunken mess. Jenny is then let go by the asylum and we find out that she kills her mom, but I did not put pictures of either of them on here because they are not important, but we don't see Jenny again. She's kind of giving Wednesday Adams just a little bit. She's serving very much Jenna Ortega. Oh my gosh, her name is Jenny. Jenna. Twins. Day 37, November 1st, 1964. Jude packs her bags and is sent to a girls school or a boys school or something in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Lana, while in the basement of Bloody Face, Oliver Threadson tries to escape. Threadson tries to kill her, but she talks him down. And this is disgusting because he has the whole Bloody Face mask on and he's ready to do it. And she's like, it's okay, baby you're gonna be okay, mommy's right here. She just did what she had to do to survive. She's a survivor. I'm a survivor. And then Mary, pretending to be Sister Jude, uh, receives a call from Sam. And later on, we see her going to his apartment as Sister Jude to kill him because once he gets further on his trail, even if Jude is gone, he would have still exposed him, which would have led to this whole operation being shut down and she can't have that. At the end of the episode, we see Jude finds Sam in a pool of his own blood. He reveals that one of her nuns did this to him. She's already suspicious of this one right here. All right, so excuse the outfit change and the hat. My hair was not behaving today. So I had to wear a hat in order to cover that up, but uh, we begin episode seven through 13 today. Episode seven starts out with this side character that we haven't been introduced to yet. I believe his name is Miles. He is listening to the voices in his head, and he's an inmate at the asylum, by the way, and he's listening to the voices in his head that tell him to commit suicide. That is what he attempts to do on the blade of the, like, meat slicer or something at the asylum. While he's in this state of shock because he's literally cut himself open, he writes the name of the angel of death on the wall, but it's in ancient Aramaic, so nobody understands what it is beside Mary Eunice. And we come to find out that it is Francis Conroy right here, the angel of death. The episode is not about her, but a lot of the characters get visited by her. So the episode opens day 37, December 1st, 1964, which carries on from the last episode when Jude started packing her bags to leave Briarcliff. In this second or third scene, I believe it is, Grace, after being abducted by aliens and getting something implanted in her, Grace starts bleeding out everywhere, all over the bed. The nuns and nurses around are quick to call Arden. Arden claims he doesn't have any idea what sterilization they are talking about because the nurses and nuns were like, she must have been sterilized by you, of course, because Jude off Jude threatened it and that was the last we heard about it. And he was like, I did not sterilize this queen. We get a scene where Mary Eunice goes into Miles's room and because he's still alive, he like got bandaged up and everything and he is trying to commit suicide again because little ill in the head and she finds the angel of death right here trying to kill Miles and 
Eventually she does, but the devil finds her and they have like a little conversation. They're like, oh, I know who you are and you know who I am and we're among the living, but we're not living. So then we cut to Fredson's house. Um, if we forgot what happened in the last couple episodes, he is bloody face. He is the one that is doing all these gruesome killings. And Lana is in his basement after he kidnapped her from the asylum. So Lana has been down in his basement for about a week, a little over a week at this point. And the scene opens with bloody face R wording Miss Lana here. Disgusting. What is with this show and just R wording everyone? Why? Why does it have to be so much? There's so many assaults and R word scenarios. We then get a scene where Threadson apologizes to Lana because Lana is basically cosplaying as his mother. Disgusting. He apologizes because he says that she definitely did not need that and they should just go back to being mommy and son, which is disgusting. This allows Lana to catch him while he's off guard and attack him because she's broken free of her chains and so while he's distracted telling her he's sorry, she gets out and attacks him and attempts to chain him up, but I believe he ends up breaking free of that. So she ends up getting free and getting in, uh, like going to the road and getting in the car with a strange man. Now this man I did not include on here. I did not include on here because he's not important. He dies in literally 30 seconds. Basically, she's like, he's trying to kill me. Get me away from him, please. And the man is literally like, what's wrong with you bitches? Lana basically watches this man kill himself in the car with a gun. And this ends up sending the car into a tree. So she was in a car crash. She was, so then she ends up being found unconscious by the police and taken back to Briarcliff later that day. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh my goodness, Lana. So then day 38, the next day, December 2nd, Lana wakes up in Briarcliff and she's back where she started, babes. We get a flashback to June 20th, 1949. Jude is fired by her band for her excessive drinking. Now, this is what causes Jude to go on a bender and hit the girl in blue. I believe her name is Missy in 1949. Now we pick back up with Jude and the last we saw of her is she is tending to Sam who was killed by the devil and she uh, watches him die has to pick herself back up so she goes to a diner she looks a little rough her hair's a mess she's got blood all over her it things are not looking good for her she has not been having a good couple days so in this diner she has a meeting with the angel of death because she wishes that she was dead and i think what they explain it in the show is that when you wish that you were dead or you're about to die, she appears. So I guess these two have had a relationship for quite literally years. And it's revealed that the first time that Jude saw the angel of death was the night that she killed the girl, I believe. And, or that was one of the times. And then there was another time when she couldn't have kids, like when she got an STD and lost the ability to have children. So her boyfriend left her or something. So she wished she was dead back then. So basically she has had a long relationship with this angel of death and is no stranger to her. Basically vibes, this scene is incredible. And this is one of my favorite episodes because of this. They just, when they're on screen together, it's magic. We saw that in the last season. We'll see it in the next season. Also, I forgot to mention in this time, because Kit confessed on tape to the murders of all of the Bloody Face killings, he was taken to jail just a couple days ago. It was during episode five, I believe. And during episode seven, we find out in this episode that he escapes jail and he has been trying to get back to the asylum to get Grace free because he knows that she's gonna get sterilized. So we jump down to day 45. So a week later, it's December 9, 1964. So Jude ends up going to this little girl Missy's house to apologize to the parents or rather like give her regards to the parents quite literally like 10, 15 years after the fact. She ends up finding out that this little girl isn't even dead at all. She is alive and well and I believe a nurse assistant or something. And she has a baby of her own and has been living with her parents for all this time. The girl didn't end up dying on the side of the road. So so while Lana is in the sick bay for her injuries sustained during said car crash, she accuses the Redson of everything and the devil right here is like, I already knew that. And she's not going to do anything about it. She's not going to do a single thing about it because she wants evil. So then we move on to day 56, December 20th, 1964. This is the day that Kit escapes jail. He sneaks back into Briarcliff where he finds Grace and she is making bread. She is unable 
able to do really anything because of the situation in her uterus and she's not she's not doing well she's looking a little sickly the nun finds them one of the monsters outside basically just gets in through the secret passage and follows kit and yeah frank shoots for the monster but accidentally kills grace collateral you know the asylum takes back kit and highly illegal by the way because he was sent to jail and he escaped jail and ran back into the asylum first of all why would you do that babe like i understand wanting to be back with her but you escaped one jail to get back into another Okay, and that's basically where we leave episode 7. It's one of my favorite episodes because I like the recurring motif of the angel of death. She also gives the kiss to Grace, which is a nice little cap on the episode. So that's where we leave episode 7. Episode 8 is a Christmas-centered episode, and mm -hmm, this is one of the best episodes as well. The episode begins with a flashback to December 19th, 1962, in which this crusty right here, he kills a Santa Claus that's outside of like a mall or a toy store or something, and assumes his position and goes on a killing spree, pretending to be Santa Claus a few days before Christmas, and he ends up in the asylum just under a year later. Then we jump to day 57 December 21st we see Mary making a makeshift Christmas tree with all the inmates in the asylum and she uses people's hair and one guy's dentures and a bunch of random trinkets from all over the asylum to create this tree with a bunch of makeshift ornaments on it which is kind of cute kind of slight it's kind of giving Hobby Lobby it's giving Pinterest don't hit on the Pinterest tree we see Jude breaking back into the asylum after a couple weeks of not being there and and in charge at all of anything. She was fired, remember, and she's been like on Bender the last couple weeks. So we see her sneak back into the asylum to try and kill Mary, but this whole interaction is seen by Frank and a bunch of the other orderlies, and they escort her out. So she's quite literally removed from the premises of the place that she used to work. We then move to two days later, day 59, December 23rd. We see Mary release Lee Emerson from his holding cell because he's been in solitary for a year after what happened on Christmas Eve the year before. December 24th, 1964, Lee kills an orderly while they were decorating for Christmas. Christmas morning, Arden aligns with Jude to take down the devil in Sister Mary Eunice because he no longer sees the innocence and purity in her soul and it took quite literally giving her shit stained earrings and her accepting them with uh, open arms to get him to realize that she's the devil. Which, that is a sentence I didn't think I would ever have to say. So then in another scene we see Lana finding Kit who's on a bunch of drugs. So the asylum, Briarcliff, is keeping Kit from the state to cover up the murder of Grace. So Lana finds him basically passed out at this point, dreaming, hallucinating, everything like that, and she promises to get him out, so she's devising a plan. Jude breaks into the asylum with the help of Arden, and Arden ends up double-crossing her. Who could have seen that coming? Let's just face it, he's still in love with her, no matter how able she is. He locks her in a room with Lee Emerson, the Santa killer, when she thought that she was going to be in a room with Mary to kill Mary, which this is just iconic. This whole season is iconic, especially the Christmas episode. This section of the season, iconic. You can't deny it. You just can't deny it. The twists, the turns, the backstabbing, legendary. Because then in the very next scene, we see Mr. Blayface return to the asylum to confront Lana. And Lana's like, what are you doing here? He is here to exact his revenge. Oh, it's not a good Christmas. It's not a good Christmas for these girls. Kids passed out. She's being attacked. She is found by her attacker and Grace is dead. So it's it's not good for the girlies at this point. Basically in Jude's struggle with Lee, Jude ends up slicing his neck and he almost bleeds to death, but Jude is found and taken capture. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. She becomes an inmate at this asylum for the attempted murder of Lee and the actual murder of Frank, which is done by the devil herself. What an episode. So that ends the Christmas episode, one of the best episodes of television I've ever seen in my entire life. And the next episode, the next like three or four episodes are quite literally on the same level of iconic and slay. <laughs> 
Alright, so episode 9 begins to a flash forward in 2012. We are introduced to Johnny. Now, Johnny is the son of Bloody Face. We'll find more about him in 1964 storyline, but for now, in 2012, we see him at the therapist because he uh, reveals that he is into some killing. He's into the same thing that his father was into, and that is cutting the skin off of women. So we see here, October 23rd, 2012, Johnny kills his therapist, who is not pictured because she's not important but Johnny does end up killing his therapist. So then we see day 63, two days after the events of the magnificent Christmas episode. The first scene, we see Lana finding out through Mary Eunice that she is pregnant. That can mean only one thing. The only person she slept with, against her will, might I add, is Bloody Face here. So yes, Johnny is the child of Lana and Bloody Face, aka Dr. Oliver Threadson. So then we see Jude waking up in her bed because she is now an inmate here at this asylum after the events of the last episode when she was framed for the murder of Frank and attempted murder of Lee Emerson. We see flashbacks from the day prior where Lee, Timothy Howard, Mary Eunice, and a couple of the other nuns give their statements to get this woman in prison unjustly, by the way. Arden also gives a testimony to the police and they definitely, they deem her not sane. So she is quite literally in prison. I stand with Jude. I stand with Jude no matter what, even if she is a piece of shit. I stand with her, she did not deserve this. That's Jessica Lang. that's my bestie right there. We get a scene where Lee tells Jude that he forgives her for trying to kill her and this is all ironic because sir you are the grossest slimiest grimiest murderer of them all here at this asylum. Miss Girl didn't do anything she was just defending herself in a situation that she didn't know she was going to be put in because he betrayed her. I forgot to mention in the last episode they both knock him out and hold him in like a closet so he's been their prisoner for two days, so they devise a plan to kill him. But now that Lana knows that she's pregnant, she decides to use this to her advantage to get a confession out of him. So that night, Lana attempts to abort her child. However, this fails. She uses a coat hanger, which is a reference to the episode title, The Coat Hanger. Iconic, by the way. This fails, and Mary can sense that the baby is still in her, and she's like, well, damn it, what am I supposed to do now? We then see the next day, day 64, uh, December 28th, Lee Emerson is baptized by Timothy Howard at the church. He was given, like, a day pass, I guess, and they went to the church to baptize him, and this does not end well. This does not end well because Timothy ends up getting crucified by by Lee on the cross, just as Jesus was himself. Oh my lord. He ends up running free and we don't see him again, but an iconic, iconic performance. He is still crusty and deserves this because why would you trust this man over your, like, friend, your colleague? I just, Timothy Howard is a crust on this season. He's the barnacle. So during all of this, we see Lana get Threadson to confess on tape with Kit in the background with a tape recorder that he is bloody face and he did all the killings. So we now have a taped confession of Threadson admitting to the murders and we have a taped confession of Kit admitting to the murders. However, the confession of kits obviously isn't real. So then later they go into his little holding area and he's gone. By her. She set him free and has offered him a full-time position at this place, which I think I mentioned in the last episode. So not only is he a situation, but he quite literally is in charge of them now. Then Arden finds Kit trying to hide the tape that Redson confessed on, and he doesn't really care about the tape. He just wants to find out what these aliens are up to, and the audience is very much as well. So they use Kit to summon these aliens to the asylum because Kit is kind of like their test subject, I guess. So if Kit's life is in danger, then the aliens are gonna come. Arden kills Kit in order to get the aliens to come back to figure out what happened to Grace because Grace was abducted whilst uh, Arden was moving her body to the crematorium to be cremated. Grace was taken by the alien and so Arden is trying to get the aliens to come back to figure out what the hell is going on with these two and the alien abduction. This causes the aliens to return with Grace and Pepper who you may remember from earlier episodes. She makes a return this time she's able to speak and she's quite more intelligent than everyone here at this asylum it seems. She knows what's going on. We see Jude is now basically allowed in the common room and she has a scene with Lana and she apologizes to Lana for everything that she did quite literally less than a month ago. So she promises that she's gonna get her out of here and Lana's like, 
that's not gonna happen. You don't have the power around here anymore, babes. I'm gonna get out on my own. So then whilst Arden hides Grace and Pepper in another room, Kit ends up getting revived by Arden. I believe that happens in the next episode but he revives Kit and hides Grace and Pepper in the other room, and that's where we leave off on episode nine. Another stellar episode, by the way. The next one, I think is the highest rated episode. All right, so episode 10 is one of my favorite episodes. It's called The Name Game, and we'll get to why it's called The Name Game in a little bit, but I believe it's one of the highest rated episodes in the history of American Horror Story, deservedly so. So we begin with January 3rd, day 70. Uh, Mary here buys a jukebox after Jude destroyed the record player. In the last episode, I forgot to mention that, she is all doped up on drugs, so she destroyed the record player, and so she bought a jukebox to please everybody. We see Thread Redson confronting Kit and Lana after their attempt to expose him with the tape recorder. And then day 71, January 4th, Jude gets electroshock therapy. We see Timothy returning to the asylum after being crucified a few episodes back. He had an interaction with the angel of death who basically told him that Mary has got the devil in her. So his mission now that he actually believes what Jude said is to cast the devil out of Sister Mary Eunice. And you think that this would make him any less of a crust, but he's still, he's still disgusting and awful. She R-words him and takes his virginity from him because he is a Monsignor. So she takes his virginity and this is just quite ironic because she's the devil and she took his innocence from him. Then the next day, day 72, January 5th, we see Arden going outside and killing all the monsters that he created because he basically says that the experiment is over once he he realizes that they're just not gonna do any good. Mary's like, well, what'd you do that for? Like, you just spent so many years of your life on it and now you're just killing them. Arden, he's kind of a lost quads. He thinks he doesn't, and he's true, he's right. Like, there's nothing he can really do for anybody anymore, you know? He should just kind of just end it all at this point. Timothy apologizes to Jude. Uh, Jude, obviously, you can't really accept this apology because she's all doped up and has been electroshock therapized earlier on in the episode, so she's, she's kind of not there for this conversation, but he apologizes to Jude for not believing her. You know, we think that this would be a redemption arc for him, but no. Like I said, he's still disgusting and crusty, and we'll see later on why. We see the Redson find Grace and Pepper, and he ends up helping Grace deliver the baby. We see Timothy have a conversation with Mary at the staircase, and we can see Mary is still in there somewhere. She's like, please end my suffering. This demon has been in me for months, and I don't know how to get rid of it, and I just want it to be over. Timothy shoves her down the grand staircase, and she dies. The angel of death takes not only Mary, but the devil with her. Her. That's kind of a premature ending to this whole storyline with her. I think she's a great villain. I think she should stay till the last episode. And Lily Rabe, as always, does an incredible job here. And I don't know why they decided to kill her in episode 10. But there wasn't really much left to do, I guess, with this whole storyline. So they really pulled the plug here and decided to narrow their amount of characters towards the end of the season. And I guess she just had to go first. The next day, day 73. Somewhere in here, I I believe it's day 71, I forgot to mention. The whole cast, really, all the inmates have a little musical number called The Name Game, and that's why the episode is called The Name Game. Judy does not remember who she is, so Lana's like, do you know your name? Jude here is like, they break out into song and start singing the name game. But then back to day 73, as I said, January 6th, we see uh, Mary's body get cremated by Arthur and Arthur ends up jumping on top of her and going into the furnace himself as well. So both of these two die in this episode. He believes he needs to pay for his crimes, which he does because he's disgusting, and evil monster Nazi. So it's a fitting end for both of these two, the devil and quite literally the devil himself in human form. Fredson brings Kit to Grace, who has recently given birth, and introduces Kit to his biological son, Thomas, in exchange for bringing Grace back to Kit. Bloody Face asks Kit 
tells him where the tape recording of him confessing to the murders is. And because Kit is a family man, he brings Redson to where it is. And in doing this, Landa shows up and is like, not even Kit knows where it is now. I hit it. This is kind of the slay of the century. Miss Landa's just on top of everything. So then we have a scene with Jude telling Mother Claudia down here. I don't think I mentioned her before. She is like a nun that works for the church. She helps get Lana out because Jude says that Lana does not belong here and Jude wants Lana to like take the whole asylum down with all the evidence that she has. There's quite a few pieces of evidence here. This asylum is not running under good management. It's a Slay episode. The musical number is amazing. Ryan Murphy really used his experiences on Glee for this one and that's another amazing show you should go watch. All right, so just ignore the tape down here, but episode 11 begins with Johnny again. And this time it is uh, October 28th, so about a week after he killed his therapist. He hires a prostitute and they have some interesting things going on. He has a mommy fetish just like his dad did. He ends up killing his prostitute off screen, I believe, but it's a weird opening to the episode. It's whatever. Anyway, we move on to 1960 five now, January 6th again, so to carry on from episode 10, uh, Lana is released by Mother Claudia here, whilst Kit is talking to Threadson about how to get the tape from Lana, and while this is all happening on the staircase, we get like a split screen situation where Lana is walking down the stairs to get out, scarf over her head so that Threadson can't see her leave. Threadson and Kit are walking up the stairs as she is walking down. Threadson sees the back of her head and recognizes it somehow and as she's getting into the cab to get out he sees that she leaves and as she is leaving she puts the tape on the window so that he sees that she has it and then she flips him off she's an icon so she confronts him at his house later that night and they have like a long drawn out conversation about how he is not going to survive he's going to end up in prison or the asylum before he can make a move on her life and try to kill her she pulls out a gun and kills him. So this kind of ends the 1964 to 1965 storyline. We get a couple flash forwards from here on, but with the death of Bloody Face and the win that Miss Lana has here and the story that she publishes after this, this is kind of the end of the main story and we still have two episodes to go and half of this one to get through. So a few days later, January 12th, Lana visits Wendy's grave slash like memorial. This is an iconic scene the white walls and the white gravestones and stuff and she's walking through it and she's in all black with her little sunglasses that's iconic that's history right there she walks out and tells the reporters to quote buy my book we see jude is taken to solitary Because Kit is found innocent after the whole story with Bloody Face comes out, he is released and he has one wish before he leaves, and that is that uh, Grace is also released at the same time. So they both go home and find who? Alma in their house. And she has returned and somehow she's still alive. I don't know. I guess the aliens really had her body. Bloody Face made up some random other body. So she ends up having a kid up in space with the aliens. Uh, Kit's kid, obviously. Both of these two end up living with Kit for the next few years, and we'll pick back up on their story in another episode. But that's kind of the conclusion of the main story. Once Kit is released, Grace is released, Lana is released, and exposes Threadson, and he is dead. That's kind of the end of the main story, and this episode really wraps up a couple things, but the next two episodes really wrap everything up, and we'll get into those as well. Another thing we end up seeing on January 13th, uh, Lana nearly aborts her son that's still growing inside of her Johnny here. We see Lana go to the police in one of the flash forwards. It's April 2nd. She goes to the police to try and get Briarcliff shut down, but they can't really do anything about it because there's not much evidence to support that all these people have been disappearing from this asylum since Arden went out and quite literally killed all of them. Lana ends up going to the uh, asylum to get Timothy Howard to release Jude because Jude does not 
deserve to be locked up. Obviously she didn't do anything wrong, but Timothy claims that Jude is dead, and this is false. Lana ends up leaving with nothing, and there's a false death certificate that Lana is given as proof, but then we see in another scene, Jude is in a holding cell with a completely new name, Betty Drake. She's still there, unfortunately, and he is just keeping her there because of his ego. So then August 28th, 1965, Johnny here is born to Lana, and she has to breastfeed him or else he will not stop crying. And, oops, let's see. She gives him up for adoption and hates the idea of living with him and raising him, which girl, obviously, no one's gonna blame you for that. And that's basically where we leave episode 11. The penultimate episode opens with Kit pulling an axe out of Grace's back, and this takes place June 1st, 1967. So it's just a little under two and a half years after these two were released and found Alma in their house. Kit pulls an axe out of Grace's back, and we're just kind of left wondering what's going on. We cut a few days before this, May 30th, 1967. Uh, Grace is still all obsessed about the alien situation that happened to them two years ago and she's drawing all these pictures of all the aliens and stuff and this is kind of disgusting miss alma here she wants to forget about that time of her life and grace wants to relive it and share it with the children kit is kind of indifferent to the whole thing and he's just like can't we just be a big happy family because they are living a polygamous relationship and kit has to be shared by grace and alma alma she is a flop if i've ever seen one your man fell in love with someone else else while you were up in the sky. Deal with it. So the next day, June 1st, we cut back to that night. Grace and Alma are fighting over who can have Kit because Alma thinks that Grace should have Kit because she's clearly a little obsessed with the whole alien situation. And Grace is like, you should go to Alma because she seems distressed lately, a little on edge as of late. And Kit is like, I'm just trying to do what comes natural. This causes her to get jealous. She kills Grace with the ax that we saw in the first scene. So yeah, Grace dies and the two children, Juliet and Thomas, are left with just one mother and a father. We move to March 7th, 1960. Jude has a series of scenes in which she still believes she's in 1965 and she plays poker with Pepper who again still has the ability to speak at this point. She gets to know all the inmates and is really friendly with everyone and becomes like kind of like the leader of everybody there. These are not real scenes. These are just her imagination and it is in fact 1968. She hallucinates that Timothy is still at the asylum when in reality he has left at this point and he was appointed Cardinal of New York, which flop. It's revealed through this, Jude is brought to the office of the new management because the church sold the asylum in the aftermath of Lana's expose about the asylum and like to get it off their hands. So the state is now in control of the asylum. She now goes by Betty Drake, as her file says. Jude has a fake death certificate. The woman that now runs the asylum, she reveals that two years ago, Pepper died. She's just been imagining her this whole time. So then we move on to Lana's portion of the episode. So Lana has a meet and greet on March 24th, 1969. This is where Kit finds her. So just two years after the whole debacle with Grace and Alma, Kit meets up with Lana again. So they go to lunch and catch up. Kit reveals to Lana that Alma killed Grace. So then after this, Lana's like, I don't really know what else you want me to do. Lana, she's kind of become a cheap celebrity at this point. Like she is a little selfish here. She has kind of got caught up in all the glamour and she's forgotten about why she started this whole thing in the first place. And that was to get this man exposed of his lies and hypocrisy and to get the whole thing shut down. December 1st, 2012, Johnny buys a first edition copy of Lana's book, Mania, that is signed. Basically, he reveals his plan is to kill her and that is what we will pick up on in the finale but yeah that's episode 12 it's most people's least favorite episode of the season which i understand not a whole lot happens it's kind of just flash forwards to other parts in time and you don't really get a whole lot of story you just kind of find out a couple of things about the futures of kit lana and jude who are like the main three characters of this season <laughs> 
we have finally made it to the finale of Asylum. This board. This board is really going through it right now. There are a couple pieces of the timeline that are kind of falling apart, but that's okay. December 4th, 2012, we jump to the present day. I don't have a picture of the present day Lana Winters, but she is much older looking, obviously, because it's like 40 years later. So Miss Girl is giving an interview, a sleigh interview on the couch, giving Oprah just a little bit. We learn that she became a huge name in television, but at this interview we can see Johnny lurking around. In the last episode we learned that his plan is to kill her after this interview, but we learn through Lana that in 1970, January 5th, a few months after Kit visited her and told her to do something about this whole ordeal at the asylum, she went into the asylum with film cameras and recorded the conditions and aired an expose on the whole entire thing to get it shut down. We see January 15th, so just a week or two after this happened, Kit and Lana meet at Kit's house. Kit reveals that he got Jude out himself and nursed her back Back to health, housed her for a few months, but she ended up dying on December 12th, 1969. The angel of death finally came to claim Jude's soul, unfortunately, but she had a good few six months. We see flashbacks of her bonding with Kit's children and helping to raise them a little bit. They kind of refer to her as their grandmother. It's a nice little redemption arc for Jude to be able to do something and give back to her community a little bit. We then see a month after this, uh, Lana ends up airing an expose on Timothy Howard and his atrocities that he committed at this asylum and let go under the radar. So such as hiring a Nazi and letting the devil herself walk among this place. This ends up getting him so embarrassed that he commits suicide in his house. I couldn't think of a better ending for this crusty. We find out in the mid 70s, so 1975, that Lana visits Johnny at his school just to meet him once. We also find out through Lana that Kit got married again sometime in the mid 70s as well. By 1980, he developed pancreatic cancer and was yet again taken by the aliens, never to be heard of or seen again. So after her interview is over, the crew leaves and Lana is left alone with Johnny who comes out of the shadows and they have a stare down basically. He threatens to kill her and then because he has mommy issues she sucks up to him in the same way that we saw her suck up to Oliver in 1964 when she was his prisoner. That's when he lets his guard down and she shoots him right in the head. In conclusion Miss Lana Winters is mother. Really the lone survivor this season. No one else here on this board that I can think of survives. Timothy kills himself. She dies by Alma's hand. Kit has pancreatic cancer and is taken by the aliens. Jude dies of the Angel of Death's kiss. Oliver and Johnny are both killed by Lana. These two die. Really, Lana is the lone survivor here, and she's mother for that. So that basically wraps up my Asylum recap slash timeline slash character explanation. There are a lot more aspects to this that were just a tad harder than Murder House, might I add. The timeline itself was a little bit easier to come up with because there are specific dates that are given and other ones are kind of just guessed. That's Asylum. I'm sure I might have forgotten something somewhere in there, just a little bit probably, most likely, definitely. Stay tuned for Coven because that is also coming very soon. As of filming, this is September 24th, so I should be, in theory, uploading the Murder House video sometime next week. And then hopefully I'll spend about a couple weeks editing this one and I'll have it up within a few weeks of the Murder House video. I'll get started on Coven and Break Show and we'll have a little part. I will see you guys in the next one, babes.